Well, good afternoon. First, I want to thank every one of you for staying. Okay, it's after lunch Friday, the last session. It, that usually empties the room out. So thanks for staying for this last session, um, formal session. And um, yeah, one more after the break. <laughs> oh, we do. Okay. Well, either way, thank you. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to start out with Nicole from the Charlotte Harbor Estuary Program. Uh, her paper is Evaluating Natural Capital as an, an Economic Driver. All right. Great. All right. Well, thank you all for having me. Again, my name is Nicole Idavia. I am the Research and Outreach Manager for the Coastal and Heartland National Estuary Partnership. Um, so I'm going to be uh, presenting today on a project on behalf of all of the um, members of our partnership, all the resource managers, scientists, policymakers, and community members, and our executive director, Jennifer Hecker, and the rest of our staff. So I just wanted to do a quick shout out to all of those entities that were um, a big part of uh, completing this project, as well as the Balmoral Group, who we uh, contracted to do the work for this. So uh, go ahead, next slide. So again, uniting uh, partners and resources to look at um, economic capital with uh, natural resources. So um, for those of you that aren't as familiar with the CHNEP or NEPs in general, um, they are again public-private partnerships um, that are uh, based in a way that uh, we're looking at all of the ecosystems in a more regional manner. So we're able to work with federal, state, local entities, as well as um, community groups, we're able to work with, um, again, uh, private businesses as well. And so we're consensus-based, non-regulatory, and science-based. So it kind of makes us the perfect space to complete some of this regional restoration and research work um, that can't be done by any one entity. Uh, next slide. And for those of you not as familiar with the CHNEP area, we're actually located in central and southwest Florida. So you can see our watershed starts up at the top of Polk County in central Florida and goes all the way down through Lee County, which is where Estero Bay is, that's our most southern estuary. We actually stretch all the way out to Lake Okeechobee in Glades and Hendry County. So we cover several estuaries, um, Charlotte Harbor being our largest right in the center there. Um, and it stretches all the way from Lemon Bay down to, as I mentioned, Estero Bay. So uh, we there are four major rivers in our project area and we cover over 5,400 square miles of, of area. So um, one of the things that I wanted to point out that's unique about some of the estuary programs is we work with both inland and coastal partners. So there's some counties in our region that actually don't even, they're not even located on the coast, but they're um, key to our partnership and also sort of one of the key drivers that we try and look at all of our projects through that lens of these heartland partners along with these coastal partners and bringing together uh, members in those 10 counties and 25 cities on uh, projects that everyone mutually agrees upon. Next slide. Uh, so what are those projects? So they are all determined by our five-year strategic plan, um, which are uh, organized under those four action items that you see up there. But today I really wanted to focus in on the public engagement section, because really it's not a separate section. Public engagement is woven of our program and uh, sort of is what's highlighted in the project that I'm going to talk about today. Next slide. So um, the project purpose. So what was the problem we were looking to solve? Well, um, what we would like to do is address the area of disconnect between uh, environmental sciences and the realm of policy, which we again believe that NEPs are uniquely situated to address that problem in that um, we can be the science communicators, uh, providing to policymakers some of the tools that will help them make decisions that will help protect our water, wildlife, and resources. And so in this instance, what we wanted to do is evaluate existing natural capital and um, justify investments in that for the future. I think some people brought that up today that, um, again, we're pushing against uh, population pressure. Um, as people continue to move to Florida, there's a thousand people moving to Florida per day. So we're coming up against some development um, in certain areas and some habitat loss and some water quality degradation. So again, um, it just uh, underscores why this is an important project to be looking at right now. And it again is vital to connect the value of environment, restoration and resource protection to the economy. Next slide. So um, as I mentioned before, we are located in central and southwest Florida. Um, this is one of the fastest growing population centers and economies in the entire country. 
And um, the natural environment is a huge driver for the economy and the popularity of the region. So it's not only tourism based uh, for the most part, but it's also natural resource based. Agriculture, commercial fishing are the drivers for the economy in our region. So it's not like our environment slash our economy, it's our environment is our economy. So uh, we completed an economic valuation study recently for the natural resources of the area. And I'm gonna quickly dive into the methodology and then get to the results because that's that's the good stuff. So next slide. Um, so we went, we talked about the why, this is the how. So uh, again, the column on the left you'll see are the economic values that were actually quantified from this project. And then the other column are the investments that we would like to justify or encourage um, within local counties and agencies throughout the region. Next slide. So again, we wanted to use real world data um, so we wanted to take a really conservative approach to assess widely accepted economic benefits as those in the policy realm are much more likely to use those as decision-making tools. So, um, you know, there are uh, ecosystem, you know, justifications for understanding the value of ecosystems themselves, but what we wanted to do is actually quantify that in real dollars. And so you can see there just um, some of the ways that we went ahead and did that. Next slide. And um, I'm not gonna get into this too much, with limited time, but for those of you that are interested in economic modeling, we have the full report and appendices available on our website. But these are the three uh, main models that we use to do the evaluation, which is economic impact modeling, which is again looking at uh, production and then spending within uh, those areas. Fiscal impact modeling, which is looking at tax data and then non-market hedonic modeling, which is looking at how property values are impacted by being next to not just water, but clean water. Uh, next slide. Okay, so getting to the results. Uh, I think the numbers really speak for themselves here. So you can see right there at the top, um, within the CHNEP area, the total economic output annually is $13.6 billion per year. So again, just to underscore that the benefits of restoration and resource protection investments are now clear and quantifiable. So continued investment is necessary to support a healthy quality of life and economic activity that depends on these resources. Next slide. Uh, one of the other things that we wanted to do is make sure that we were able to quantify um, the, the results from our habitat restoration needs plan. CHNEP, like other NEPs, is the center for sort of creating a um, habitat plan for the region. And so, what we wanted to do is look at the, the plan that we had created and then again quantify the investments that are being made and quantify the outcomes, the economic outputs, should we um, implement that plan entirely. So the Habitat Restoration Needs Plan, and I don't know if any of you stopped by the poster earlier this week, but we had a poster on it um, and there's more on our website if you're interested, was developed to guide habitat preservation, conservation, connectivity and re resiliency throughout our region. Um, and the overall goal is to increase the acreages of native habitats in the CHNEP area, both strategically and opportunistically. So full implementation offers landscape level uh, habitat protection. And you can kind of see there how the conserved land, the already conserved lands in green sort of fold together with those potentially preservable lands in blue to create wildlife corridors. And that was the goal is to be strategic because again, there's going to be areas that are not open for preservation because they're going to be needed for continued economic development. So um, that was the overall goal of the plan. And if you go to the next slide, you can see the results from that. So again, we wanted to underline that actively managing ecosystems and ecosystem services is vital to sustaining communities and a large part of the economy. And conservation and restoration require expenditures. And again, we're always competing with other reasons, other things that policymakers need to fund. So putting these with real dollars and cents really help uh, decision makers to understand why these investments are important. So the HRN proposed uh, additional conservation of 886,000 acres throughout the CHNEP 5,000 square mile area at a total cost of approximately $7 million. But it is estimated that these investments would generate economic benefits of over $10 million annually. Uh, next slide. All right, so um, that, uh, kind of going through those those big results, um, how did we go back to circling back to communication with policymakers? What we tried to do is create easily digestible fact sheets by uh, county and by basin, because again, this is a really diverse region, and the approach wanted to capture the unique features through each basin in the CHNAP area. Uh, next slide. And so up here we have um, just an example of what kind of information is available on the fact sheets. So this is the Caloosahatchee River Basin. 
that's down in the bottom right hand corner in the teal. Again, this is a basin that stretches all the way from Lake Okeechobee out to Pine Island Sound, so a really diverse basin. But we've identified that the primary economic driver is again tourism, followed by another other natural resource-based activities. Next slide. And those are all quantified here. So 494 million in economic benefits overall. Um, you can see there's an increase in property values. You can see that it also impacts agricultural and fishing production. And in the bottom right-hand corner, that is, again, our relationship back to the Habitat Restoration Needs Plan. So should we preserve all the areas that we identified in the Caloosahatchee River Basin, um, that would be the total annual output of the benefit of preserving those areas into native habitats. Next slide. Um, additionally, in each basin, we tried to pick an example project where we quantified the benefits of that project. Um, this example is Donna Bay Restoration in Sarasota County. Next slide. And you can see there on the left, the um, environmental benefits I've sort of listed out there, improved water quality, um, improved seagrass habitat. There would be a reduction in an overabundance of freshwater flow. It would be diverted back to some wetlands. And so that would, again, um, divert costs of nutrient cleaning. And you can see the net benefits over on the right are quantified at almost $80 million a year. And the benefit cost ratio is basically nine to one. So every $1 spent, there's almost $9 in return for that project. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so quickly, um, additional considerations we wanted to look at were economic equity throughout the region. Again, I mentioned there are some inland regions within CHNEP, and there's a lot of disparate need and access to resources. Um, and so what we wanted to do is complete a distributional analysis. And if you go to the next slide, you can see the results from that. And um, all basins do receive a net positive benefit from investments made in um, natural resource protection, but you can see they're pooling down at the coast. And so this sort of gives another justification for um, all of these partners coming together and pooling their regional resources and spending them through entities like the CHNEP. So, you know, using some of the, the funding from Charlotte County, which is on the coast, and then putting that towards projects way up in Polk County, which is a little bit further away from the coast. So they have, they have the funding to make those additional investments. Um, and then everyone sees the benefits. And um, yeah, that's just sort of a summary of what we went over. Uh, funding is critical to carrying out this mission and natural resource protection um, provides a ton of funding benefits and improvements to natural capital um, speaks for itself. And these are just some of the examples of the types of projects that investments pay benefits on. And the last slide is just how you can uh, find more information. And again, thank you to our management committee, the Balmoral Group, US EPA, and CHNEP staff. Thank you all. Do we have time for one question or just? Okay, we'll do them on the end. Next is um, Megan Osgood, paper on assessing the recovery of restoration effectiveness within two of the Southeast Florida mangrove forests. Hi, everyone. So again, I'm Megan Osgood. I'm with. So I'm good. Okay. Right. Hi everyone. So again, I'm Megan Osgood. I'm with Florida Fish and Wildlife um, Conservation Commission. Um, I'm going to be talking about one of our ongoing restoration projects today, um, which is in conjunction with Florida International University and Florida Oceanographic Society. Um, next. So for some background, I'm sure most of you all know, mangrove forests are a really important ecosystem here in Florida, providing lots of benefits. Um, some of the bigger ones being fish nurseries um, and coastal protection. However, it's really oh, Things. It's really easy for them to become um, stressed in these systems. So these often happen when there's tidal flow restrictions due to modified hydrology, such as berms and road construction. So when these things happen, um, they become under a lot of stress and it's been termed a mangrove heart attack. There's a lot of ways for us to identify these early stress indicators in these forests. Um, some of the most common being discolored pools of water, which you can see in the top photo there. Um, and this indicates that there's low pH in the system, there's low dissolved oxygen, coupled with um, high total and dissolved organic carbon. Another common um, indicator of early stress is gonna be adventitious root growth, which you can see in the below photo on that mangrove. And then when these mangrove forests exist in this really stressed state, it's often an on the edge type of um, effort. So until an additional stressor comes along, they're gonna continue to exist in that state. Um, and then when additional stressors do come, such as hurricanes, uh, mass mortality and peak collapse uh, can occur. 
Next slide. So then you guys recall Hurricane Irma came through in 2017 and made landfall in Florida uh, in September. You can see in that photo there is a path of hurricane as it came through. Uh, when it did make landfall, um, storm surge and high winds collectively caused stress across the street to all of our mangrove forests. And then mangrove forests that were previously under this high stress that I indicated um, previously, those faced high mortality um, from the storm. So next slide. Then for our study, uh, we looked at two uh, forests that are in the southeast side of Florida. So we have the Jensen Beach Impoundment, which is in the uh, top squared off box of the state, and then Olita River State Park in the lower squared off section of the state. Uh, both of these, as you can see, are on the east coast of Florida. And if you um, remember from our last slide, the path of Irma actually hit the uh, Gulf Coast of Florida. So the reason that these are important is that there were areas in the forest that each had a lot of those hydrological issues previously. And that's why those faced mass mortality. And then there are other ones that resulted with high stress following the storm. And then there were some areas in the forest systems that remained healthy. So when we went to these sites, we were able to um, identify all these three locations and set up three sites in each, which you can see on this map. So the red dots are going to be indicating those stress sites we identified. Um, intermediate sites are going to be indicated by those yellow dots. And then our control or healthy sites are indicated by those green dots. Next slide. All right, so then for the design of our restoration project, um, we're installing culverts and clearing of ditches that are going to improve the tidal flow and drainage and hydrological connectivity. That way these systems can then become restored. So in the left photo, you can see a whole restoration plan that's going to be happening in Jensen Beach Impoundment. And then in the right photo, you can see Alita River's um, culverts that are set up waiting to be installed. Next slide. So then for the project design and status, um, this is following a Baki or before after control impact uh, monitoring design. So as I mentioned, within Jensen Beach and Alita River State Park, we identified those stressed, moderately stressed, and natural areas that we could represent the entire forest and look at before and after the restoration within each of those forest conditions. Um, Pre-installment monitoring has been completed in Jensen Beach and Olita River State Park. And then post-monitoring will occur once the restoration is completed. However, that has been delayed currently due to um, construction permitting issues within the counties, um, but hopefully soon as uh, the next slide. <laughs> So for our field methods, when we do get out in there to do our monitoring, uh, we set up those three sites and each of those are three five by five meter plots. Um, so you can see in the top little uh, graphic, that's a nice little uh, wholesome field design. Um, so when we're doing our assessments in the four cardinal directions of each corner, we do canopy cover through densityometer uh, measurements and we do leaf area index with our LAI device. Additionally, in each corner, we do RTK elevation measurements we do soil strength through shear vein um, and soil pH with our pH probes. Uh, and then within the plot at large, we look at every single tree that exists there. Um, we tag them, record them for species, diameter at breast height, which is approximately uh, 1.3 meters high, their living status and any stress indicators that we can see. And then the number and species composition of living seedlings and saplings is also recorded um, within the plot at large. All right, so then for some pre-installment, um, Results that we have so far. Uh, first, I want to look at average canopy cover. So within Jensen Beach, um, you can see within all of the uh, forest conditions that we have, there is an increasing trend. So stressed has the lowest canopy cover, and then the natural sites have the highest canopy cover. And this you would expect since um, there's a lot of dead trees, so they're losing that canopy cover, um, which leads me to my next graph. Uh, so for percent tree mortality, um, you would expect kind of the opposite trend to our Jensen uh, beach canopy cover. However, you can see that the moderately stressed is actually higher than our stressed. And this isn't concerning, it's just the way that we do our methods. We can't um, we can't include all of the dead trees that have fallen over, and that's just because if they fell over and then they moved outside the plot, or if other ones fell over outside the plot moved into the plot, we can't accurately know where all of those came from. So if we were able to do that, you would expect that the stress could be higher. The other thing I want to mention with both these graphs is you can tell that the variation is a lot higher in our stress sites, and then it decreases. Um, so the natural has a lower amount of variation, and our variation was calculated through standard deviation. Next slide. Okay. So then looking at some of the recruitment um, in these systems. So again, we're sticking with Jensen Beach for right now. Um, so our average seedling density that we found, again, with our um, forest conditions, and then looking at seedlings um, per meter squared. 
you can see again stress is the lowest which we would expect um, and then here moderately stressed and natural are comparable and then next so for sapling density um, in the forest conditions and saplings per meter squared the stress is still lower than our moderately stressed sites and here the natural is actually lowest which might seem concerning however in a healthy mangrove forest uh, they have a limited understory due to the intense canopy so it's actually not um, an issue there there's a lot of variability with uh, their recruitment in a natural healthy forest but again we're seeing a lot of high variation in the stressed and moderately stressed areas and you can see that moderately stressed has more recruitment than the stressed um, which is good to see they have any recruitment at all before the restoration all right so now we're going to move to Alita River State Park and get some of those results so again we're starting with canopy cover and this trend shows um, a lot of similarity to our Tensa Beach uh, for canopy cover so it increases from stress being the lowest all the way to um, our natural which is the highest and then percent tree mortality here does show more of that decrease um, with stressed and moderately stressed being more comparable again if we were able to track all of the trees that died and then fell over the stress might be higher than the moderately stressed all right. and then moving on to recruitment in Alita River State Park so here we can see that the seedlings uh, per meter squared in the stress site are pretty low and then here the natural is the highest so it has that increasing trend across all of the forest conditions and then next so then our average sapling density um, again it shows a similarity with the stress and the moderately stressed um, and then natural being the highest here i do want to mention in this um leader site park there was a lot of recruitment in the natural site which is why it looks like there's so little in the stress and moderately stressed but when you compare the scales between um, the average sapling density to jensen beach uh, it's not that much different for the recruitment in Alita River State Park. It's just that here the healthy sites had more um, recruitment. All right, and next. So then for some summary of the results that we've seen, uh, canopy cover is the greatest within the natural sites and it's lower within our stress sites. Uh, percent tree mortality was the lowest within all of our natural sites. The density of seedlings and saplings are higher for most all of our natural sites. And then so now, um, once the restoration occurs, what are we gonna expect to see when we go back and do our post monitoring? So we're gonna expect that the stress and moderately stressed sites are gonna emulate the natural sites more. So having higher canopy cover, having a lower percent mortality, and then having healthy recruitment, which again can vary, but seeing how it changes will be interesting. And then we expect them to have less variation in those sites um, as they get the improved um, tidal flow and hydrology. Next. All right, so I want to acknowledge all of my co-authors you saw on the first slide, um, and then our collaborators and volunteers with Florida Ocean Rapid Society, all of our funding sources, uh, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Coastal Management Program, uh, Marine Estuary Habitat Restoration Monitoring and Assessment, and the Indian River Lagoon, and then basis for allowing me to come present with you guys. <laughs> A lot faster than I was at home. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Our next talk is Lessons Learned and Improvements in Methodology Using Hydroblasting to Create Mangrove and Saltern Habitat Without Impacts Associated with Heavy Equipment. And the authors are Bo Williams, who couldn't make you here today. Kyle is going to be doing the presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll wait for you guys. All right, good. Well, good afternoon. My name is Kyle Johnson. I'm the biologist for Aquatech Eco Consultants. And uh, we're going to be talking about hydroblasting today. It's a very simple concept for a very, but labor, very labor intensive to get rid of heavy machinery to use for mangrove restoration, pretty much. You get rid of spoil mounds. Is that okay? Sorry, I'll wait for that to come up. But, but also, I'll give you a quick basis of it. Hydroblasting uses water pumps to blow down spoil mounds that were created either by creating mosquito ditches back in the days, which they thought was going to be a good way to scroll, uh, control mosquito populations. Um, next slide, please. So, as you see, the two guys were carrying a water pump. 
So they bring these big water pumps out. We go to use these spoil mounds. Now you don't see a picture, you see the after picture right here. But they're these mounds that create a perfect growing place for invasive species like Brazilian peppers. So we bring these pumps out, we use them, use the water from the ditch, and we spray down all of the, the sand, the spoil mounds, to create an area for perfect mangrove restoration. And yes, we can plant mangroves afterward, but we let nature do its course. So hydroplex is used to remove spoil mounds in the Tampa Bay. We've been doing this over 15 years. This technique works very well to remove artificial features and impact natural environment by traditional approach instead of using heavy machinery. Now, let me reiterate, the spoil mounds become the perfect habitat for invasive species like Malanuca trees or Brazilian peppers. So we're trying to get out there and do mangrove restoration by this. Next slide, please. So you get out there on these spoil mounds and you start blasting them down. You're gonna come across a couple different things when you're blasting this down. One is the size of the mound. Now remember back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, when the Army Corps engineer decided to go out, they used big machineries to go in and create these ditches and create spoil or these mounds all over the Tampa Bay, all over Florida, South Florida. I mean, you can even see them in, um, uh, so I'm losing the blank right here, in one of the little, in any of the state parks around here, you'll see that we're, they have the higher boardwalks because it becomes a nice area for a boardwalk because the land's already high. But they get Brazilian peppers growing on, Malanuca trees growing on, so what we want to do is blow them down. So there's a few different things associated with this. The size of the mound is a problem. The substrate of the mound, now they use big machineries, created these, but you know they could have been digging up limestone rocks, sand, whatever. Um, Water supply is a big thing. Now we are using these, we are using water pumps, so you gotta have water. So the mosquito ditches that they made back in the day were perfect for a perfect water source. However, when you're blowing these mounds down, you can't cut off your water source. So we get to these mounds, we do some clearing, you know, there's gonna be peppers on them, whatever's growing. We find that on these mounds, there is not mangroves growing on them which you would think, wow, they've been there since early 1900s. Why isn't there mangroves? The elevation is not suitable for them. The mangroves want right there at the, right at the water line, you know, right there at the lowest. And since these mounds can be six, seven foot tall, mangroves aren't growing on them. So people go, well, what about clearing them off? Aren't you killing? We're only removing invasive species because that's what's only adapted to grow on them. So one of our things, we go out there, we clear them off with other machetes. Next slide, please. So, oh, here's a picture of a mound right there, but this one's already cleared. So you see the grass on it and you see the cut around to it. So these are what's already been cleared, but these are what the mounds look like. You can see the, the red mangroves in the background, the blacks in the background, but we're trying to make it all back to a mangrove forest. So the size of the mounds is a big problem. And that's one thing we've gone out. If we do aerial photographs, we find that they're not as proper on how much volume of sand is there. So ground truthing is a big thing. And that also affects the a budget. If you're going out and you've got to blow down this mound of sand and say, okay, we're going to get this done in half a day. Next thing you know, it's three days later, the cost keeps going. So that's one thing we found. Next slide, please. So, some of the things you have to make adjustments for out there. Now, remember, we've all walked through mangroves, or I would assume with the us, and you know you could be walking for half miles and miles back there. Well, these spoil mounds are all the way through. So we're going out there. You have to carry the pumps. You have to carry the gas. You have to carry the equipment and the hoses. And so you have to make sure you bring all of this stuff out because the whole point is not to be using heavy machinery like they used to. If whatever it could take, it's more labor intensive, but whatever they can do to make it easier that more restoration happens. So we we find that, okay, well you gotta carry all the pumps out there, you gotta create little trails and all that, and sort of how it does. And then you see the picture on the right there, the gentleman standing on top there with the fire hose, just standing there all day, washing dirt away. He do, could do it in a 360 motion, and it just spreads out evenly. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
So you've got these long ditches, you've got these mounds. Now, the best part is all of the mounds are side by side by side because when they created the ditch, they just went down with machines. So everything's in a row. But you can't cut off your water supply. So you've got to find the best water supply and then strategically place your pump to pump that water throughout the whole day and throughout many mounds. If you get on a mound and blast it off and then all of a sudden that mosquito dish doesn't go up and doesn't flood anymore and you can't do that, you go, oh, now I gotta find a new water supply. So these are just some of the things you find out. You gotta strategically plan it on how you're gonna blow sand away and always have water. So um, some of these times you may have a water source. We have a project at McDill Air Force Base right now where one of our water sources is about a thousand feet away. So we got to create, put a pump there and then create all these system to hoses. And you can't just be dragging hoses through mangroves. They rip, they rip on oysters and all that. So you got to cut a nice little trail or somehow walk it by hand. So some of the things you think about and you got to keep production going. You can't clear one mound, spoil mound, and then say, okay, I got to move everything. Everything's got to be efficient to make sure you stay on budget. So next slide, please. Thank you. So another thing we do is not just remove spoil mounts, but we also want the wading birds to come back. We want to create salt terms. So what we do is we get out there in areas that we see, oh, the land elevation is the perfect height. When flooding happens, we create these dish blocks. So we could take all of that sediment from the mound, create a ditch block here, and all of that sediment you see in there was blown from the mound on either side. Now, if we were to do a, a, pan, a panoramic view of this ditch mound, behind it is a big salt turn area. So now when the water floods in, all the water floods all into the salt turn, and then the wading birds have showed back up because they have the perfect, you know, habitat for them to be going through. You get the little shrimp in there and everything, so they just start going through, and it creates a whole new ecosystem that wasn't there before. Next slide, please. There we go. So, like I said in the beginning, we like Mother Nature to do the work for us. We go out there, put her land back to how she wants it, the elevation back to how she wants it. We're blowing all this dirt down, and at the end of it, it's just a barren area. But as soon as the tide floods in, all the mangrove seeds floods. And quickly, you can see in these pictures, you get reds, whites, and within weeks, just on the high tide, those seeds just sit by themselves. We had a project a couple years at McDill. We went out there, cleared spoil mounds, and we had some nice high tides. All the white mangrove seeds had dropped. I walked out there, and it looked like a clover field. Everything was completely covered. It was beautiful. And that was just from us blowing dirt away, simplicity, without using excavators. Even the little trails we cut, just to be able to walk through, you know, just enough to get a wide pump grow back within months, new branches shoot up and all the seeds shoot right through it. So that is the natural recruitment of the seeds right here, just with title. Now we can grow, we have an aquaculture facility where we do grow reds, blacks, and whites, mangroves. And so if we find there's areas too far away that it doesn't flood enough, we plant them for ourselves. We can go out and plant in there. Or if we need to expedite, let's say we do um, clear mounds at the end of a growing season and we know mangroves won't grow or won't drop their seeds till next year, we can go in and supplement the planting. So we've got a couple of different techniques, but our greatest is letting Mother Nature do the thing for it. Perfect. Next slide, please. So we did a 1600 mounds mitigation bank by JMB, uh, Southern States Land and Timber, and we did 1,600 mounds in nine months, all with humans, all instead of big machinery. So all you see all of these lands, all of the white little dots, the pink dots and the white dots, those are mounds. Those are spoil mounds that were created by man that were growing all Brazilian peppers. They're all washed out now and replanted with mangroves and natural seeding and with by the end of the year, it's gonna be a mangrove forest again. There will be no other invasive species growing. So uh, next slide, is that it? Perfect. All right, so special thanks uh, to TBEP and 
J and B for all the work and any questions? Thank you very much. Thanks, Kyle. Next, we have Brandon Johnson. He's going to have talk about the role of project design and environmental resource permitting for the new St. Pete Pier. Thanks, Brandon. All right, good afternoon. Thank you all for sticking around. Um, Brandon Johnson with Stantec, uh, and uh, we have the opportunity to provide uh, civil engineering and environmental um, assessment and permitting services as part of, to the city of St. Pete as part of the team to plan, design, and permit the new St. Pete Pier. Uh, today, I'm gonna go through some of the features uh, in the new peer design that contributed to the environmental permitting, permitting process. Uh, but one thing to note is that the peer itself, uh, it's referred to as the peer district, it's actually broken into two separate uh, sections uh, and they had two different design and planning teams. So today we're just going to be talking about the peer itself, which is primarily the overwater portions and um, Spa Beach in that area right there. Um, okay, go to the next slide. So quick, a quick little history of uh, the pier. Um, from 1926 to 1963, uh, the picture on the screen is what was known as the Million Dollar Pier. Uh, it was uh, built after a hurricane uh, destroyed a previous pier that was actually located near the Demon's Landing site. And it had a casino at the end of it. Uh, Click again. I put in as many animations as I could to mess with Ed. So, um, next iteration from 73 to 2013 was what was known as the inverted pyramid, um, which is when I arrived in this area, that was the only pier that I knew. Um, I had the pleasure of working at the glorious pier aquarium on the second floor. Um, and then, click again. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Um, and then we have the new pier, uh, which is there today. Oh, the other thing that I, and this will be fun, Ed, you can click back, but I just wanted people to see the, note the skyline as well of St. Pete along with the pier. And obviously the pier was not the only thing that has changed. So um, the new pier opened on July 6, 2020, which is the perfect time to open a, your largest, most expensive uh, amenity for your city that encourages crowd gathering and such. Um, so that was obviously a little disappointing. Um, okay, you can click the next slide. Um, one of the things uh, that we looked at, how does design factor into the permitting process? And the approach that the, the peer team took was to develop ideas with the concept of environmental stewardship in mind. Uh, we tried to weave that into as many things as possible. And when I say we, I did not design the pier. I was the guy on the side, but the team looked at those aspects throughout the process. Uh, the original name for the, for the new pier was actually gonna be Pier Park, but then they determined that was a place in, I think, Pensacola or Panama City, and so they didn't want to get sued. But that concept of a park was kind of a, a foundation of the thinking. Um, you know, parks bring people outside, they connect them to resources, they connect them to the environment, and that was the goal of a lot of the, the features of the new pier. Um, you can click again, there you go. So um, some of the ideas that came out of that was uh, avoidance and preservation of the habitats that were there. Uh, anybody that has done environmental foundation is uh, avoidance and minimization of impacts. That's kind of ground floor, but the concept was to look past that and see if we could enhance any of the, the habitats uh, that were existing. Uh, another thing that a park does um, that led to some ideas was the, the concept of coastal thickets. Those are those uh, tree line areas uh, on the northern side of the pier. Um, and then to promote education and interaction with the environment, that's another 
kind of park feature that was brought in. Fishing has been a part of every iteration of the pier in St. Petersburg. There was some pushback and a lot of discussions on fishing at the new pier. Uh, there's a designated fishing area uh, at the uh, pier head, but the city was very adamant about maintaining that connection to fishing at the pier. Um, and then of course, uh, Spa Beach, expanding Spa Beach, and again, providing that access to the water. Okay, click the next. Uh, so new versus old design. Um, the new pier has about 1.3 acres less of impervious surface over the water. So in environmental permitting terms, that takes care of a lot of the stormwater requirements right there. You're reducing over an acre of impervious area. The old pier, as you can see, had uh, it was basically a parking lot, some iteration of a parking lot uh, for a long time. So the new pier eliminated all public vehicular traffic over water, uh, including the parking. Uh, it got rid of 28 transient boat slips that were primarily used by uh, power boats. Uh, there are a thousand less support pilings uh, for the new pier than the old design. And then the pier deck, uh, you can't really tell from that picture, but the the old iterations were, were fairly low to the water. The new deck is raised. That uh, had implications looking at sea level rise and also shading effects on some of the resources. Go ahead. And actually, click one more. We're going to come back to that one. <laughs> um, but one of the, one of the main features uh, that it was a departure from some of the previous designs was the installation of the two breakwater uh, areas on the north side of the pier. Um, these were designed to protect Spa Beach as well as the seagrass, uh, um, seagrass beds that were existing that are landward of that. Um, but but the, um, the structure itself of breakwaters that use native limestone as the primary construction material. Um, the idea there that this is going to be provide structure over unvegetated bay bottom that structure will in turn hopefully attract uh, fish that prefer that type of habitat. Uh, there was also a design section on the lee side of the uh, breakwaters that was at a lower elevation to promote oyster growth. It was like an oyster shelf on both sections of the breakwater. Um, and overall the design was, was taking into account sea level rise. Um, so now flip back, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so this is Spa Beach and um, uh, two things I'll just uh, talk about here real quick is um, one, the expansion of the beach was done by taking away the previous fill. We, we cut inland to the fill rather than adding fill to the bay uh, out in front. Um, part of that process was, <laughs> part of that process was elimination of I can't remember offhand, but a lot of seawall right in that area. So with the breakwater out in front and the removal of that seawall, it really softened that shoreline. Uh, again, thinking ahead a few years, thinking about sea level rise, that shoreline softening, as many of you know, provides at least the opportunity for habitats to migrate upslope. Uh, and that, as you can see, is one of the prime areas of the seagrass uh, at the pier. Uh, okay, next slide. Um, so the ERP process, uh, this is just kind of a list of most of the folks we engaged with. Um, the only thing I'll just touch on here is, you know, we have a, a, a policy uh, and a, an approach of early and often consultation. We try to get as many people to the table as we can, talk about designs from conceptual level, moving forward each stage, um, rather than turning around trying to submit applications and getting RAIs back. Um, it was uh, The only other thing I'll mention here is an uh, interesting scenario that the city actually owns the submerged bottom lands where the pier is at. Um, and if anybody that's done permitting, Tom and I are very familiar with working on our project now, going through that submerged sovereign land uh, uh, lease and, and agreements can be very time consuming. So that's something that uh, was we were able to avoid with the city owning the bottoms. Okay, go ahead. Um, so the first task uh, was to assess what resources were there. So I got drugged around for about two days behind a boat trying to see everything that I could. Um, uh, we did about 
I think 24 transects uh, out to the old pier head. And then where we identified resources, those were revisited in a much more detailed survey. Um, over, so this, this graphic here shows the old pier and then the proposed at that time uh, footprint. And you can see the direct impacts, the largest chunk was from the breakwater itself and that was positioned to be over unvegetated bay bottom. The critical resource there were the seagrasses and the direct impacts that were uh, assessed were from only 10 of the 400 more uh, uh, pilings uh, that went through one of the seagrass beds there. Uh, the spur feature that's mentioned is along Spa Beach. That actually was not uh, developed as part of the final design. There were design changes throughout that, but this was what was permitted. Okay, go ahead. Um, so again, getting back to that environmental enhancement, I won't dwell on this too much, but again, we did want to look at this as part of the permitting process. The, the area behind the breakwaters, there was full modeling, wind and wave analysis done, <clears throat> as well as structural for the breakwaters. But the idea of creating an environment behind those breakwaters with the softened shoreline, the idea that we could enhance that and promote the growth uh, or promote the possible expansion of the existing grasses there, uh, as well as daylighting uh, some sections uh, in that belt of seagrass zone, that optimal depth where the seagrasses are already growing at the site. Uh, we daylighted some sections of that and you can see those acreages uh, there. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so again, seagrasses kind of drove the bus uh, on the environmental resources. Uh, we monitored them pre-permit, pre post-permit and pre-construction, then construction, and we have ongoing monitoring going on right now. We've done three years of post-construction. And Ed, if you click through, you can kind of see the first five years of baseline pre-construction period, and then post-construction as those seagrass beds. And what you can kind of pay attention to is seagrass bed A and B behind that breakwater. It looks to be doing what we were hoping it would, and they're essentially coalescing into one seagrass we uh, and then you can see where the design feature did pass through seagrass bed B um, we did have some some uh, separating there we knew that, that was going to occur we are losing some seagrass uh, south of the pier where there weren't construction activities uh, but as you've heard in a lot of talks uh, we've had had some recent trends in the bay um, where some of the seagrass is declining so go ahead uh, benthic resources weren't our only concern. There are wildlife concerns. Uh, these were pretty much addressed through construction BMPs, uh, and there were many discussions on what to do on the fishing aspects, how to you how to handle carcass removal uh, at the site, uh, fishing line. Uh, so these are some of the provisions that were developed as part of the permit conditions to to manage the wildlife concerns. Next. Uh, again, some of the things that you'll see out at the pier. Oh, I wasn't supposed to say that yet. So you could see at the pier um, with signs uh, that were required by the permit, monofilament recycling. Uh, you'll see the orange bucket for carcass removal. You are not allowed to toss your fish carcass over into the water at the pier. Uh, okay, next slide. And just there's plenty of other things that went on. Uh, there's a lot of solar panels, other things that are not in the design feature, but it all led to go ahead and click again. The pier, uh, the city is applying for an Envision a Sustainable Infrastructure Award. Go ahead and click. And spoiler alert, the pier got built. And <laughs> it is there and it's available for touring. Um, so go check out some of these issues next. This is uh, the team. This is also my acknowledgement. Uh, this was the design team. We were very proud to be a part of it. And go ahead. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Kadoulis with the Mobile Bay National Estuary Program. Apologies, I couldn't be with you this afternoon. Um, I was in Tampa at the symposium earlier this week, though, and no doubt met some of you and had a great time. So many thanks to everyone that put this together and looking forward to giving you an update on watershed management plan implementation in the Doe Leaf Creek watershed.
Before diving into the Doe Lead Creek Watershed Management Plan, it's important to note on the front end that this small Huck 12 on the eastern shore of Mobile Bay has had a ripple effect that's far exceeded its actual watershed boundary. And that's because in 2013, the Mobile Bay National Estuary Program embarked upon a holistic watershed-based approach to guide coastal ecosystem restoration and protection. Our five-year ecosystem restoration and protection strategy of Respect the Connect, our comprehensive conservation management plan, integrates this idea of watershed management planning. It prescribes developments of these plans for drainage areas, not political jurisdictions, and ensures restoration projects are scientifically defensible and components of an overall management plan. We've been fortunate through funding from the Restore Act and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation Gulf Environmental Benefit Fund to have completed or will completed these watershed management plans for all tidally influenced Huck 12s in coastal Alabama. Prior to development of the watershed management plan for Doe Leave Creek, Tiawassee Creek, and Joe's Branch, the Geological Survey of Alabama had done some sediment loading analysis in the watershed and already had a hunch that uh, these were some of the highest sediment loads throughout the state. When the plan was completed in August 2010, approximately 45% of the watershed was covered in forest and agriculture, but planners anticipated most of the remaining undeveloped land would be converted to urban development. Now draining a total area of over 7,700 acres, the watershed has three principal tributaries. You see Doe Leave Creek to the northeast, Tiawassee Creek to the south, and Joe's Branch in the northwest. Now all of these empty into Doe Leave Bay and then eventually into Mobile Bay, but you see the large lake within what's called the Lake Forest Subdivision. Now when discussing uh, the Doe Leave Creek watershed, it's often been described as the perfect storm of stormwater impacts. And that's because you see the contours, they're steep and rolling topography for coastal Alabama particularly. There are highly erodible soils. We get an average of nearly five feet of hard rain annually. And looking at that uh, map of imperviousness, you can see that stormwater is going to be a major issue here because of all the urbanization. Now, when you look at that rapid expansion of development since the 70s, the cities of Spanish Fort and Daphne, as well as Baldwin County that make up this watershed, have been some of the fastest growing in the state for quite some time. Now, a big contributor to that is the Lake Forest subdivision. This has over 3,000 homes and was developed starting in the 60s through the 80s in multiple phases. And all those combinations of things and the practices of the times have led to this perfect storm of stormwater impacts. And here's a little shot of some satellite imagery from quite some time ago when the neighborhood was going through development. But you can see that um, obviously that's not something that we would want um, to be happening on a regular occasion. Now, considering all those ingredients of the perfect storm of stormwater management that we just mentioned, it makes sense that all of these streams were substantially degraded, uh, many with head cuts and bank erosion. And those sediment accumulations were not only going into downstream waters into Mobile Bay, but they were filling in the Lake Forest Lake. And during the development of the watershed management plan, you know, the stakeholder process is substantial to that. And so everyone wanted to return recreational access to the lake, which had become heavily impacted. And so these discussions of the lake actually led to um, this entire watershed restoration program getting kicked into motion. Because as most of you would agree, it makes no sense to dredge the lake and try to restore it to its former self until we can stop the bleeding in these headwaters of all these degraded streams bringing these sediments uh, down in mass quantities. When you take into account all of the field work and data collected as part of the watershed characterization process, as well as stakeholder input, it's no surprise that the top recommendation was opportunistic and strategic stream 
and floodplain restoration. We had to do something to reduce these sediment loads impacting fishery nursery habitats downstream as well as Lake Forest Lake. So implementation of these restoration projects began in 2012 with installation of a step pool stormwater conveyance on Joe's Branch tributary and they continue today with two projects currently under design in the Doleve Creek subwatershed. Project goals for this restoration program are pretty straightforward. Stabilize degraded streams, reduce downstream sediment impacts, improve the quality and clarity of water, but this last one goes beyond the traditional shovel in the ground restoration work. We needed to first be able to increase the capacity of our local resource managers, engineers and contractors, and decision makers to play a role in designing and building successful coastal stream restoration projects, as well as improving stormwater and land development ordinances, promoting low impact development, and stormwater awareness campaigns. So after 10 years of implementing the watershed restoration program, where are we at today? Well over two miles of impacted stream have been stabilized or restored. 92 acres of wetland riparian habitat have been protected or enhanced. We're updating the 2010 watershed management plan as we speak. And part of that process continues to identify and prioritize additional stream segments for restoration. But perhaps the largest victory to date has been that sediment lows in the Joe's Branch subwatershed have been reduced by 95%. Now, when the Geological Survey of Alabama did their assessment pre-restoration, uh, the Joe's Branch subwatershed had some of the highest sediment loads anywhere in the state. It was basically the poster child for what you didn't want considering sedimentation. And to come full circle with that, and then in 2020 have ADEM actually remove it from the list of impaired waters for the state, was quite an accomplishment that many, many people had their hands in over many years because there was a number of projects concentrated on that small watershed um, there you see in the northwest corner of Doleve. So the red indicate projects currently under design, but what this represents is over two miles to date, 17 individual projects, and over a $14 million investment. Other successes related to the Dole Watershed Restoration Program, not directly tied to construction projects, include the formation of an intergovernmental task force. This was made up of elected officials and decision makers within the watershed, where they went past their own geopolitical boundaries and met regularly and worked together to improve water quality and reduce stormwater impacts in Doleve. This included passing several ordinances to improve stormwater regulations, increase riparian buffers. Uh, there was a trespass ordinance to protect environmentally sensitive areas from off-road and ATVs in the watershed. And it included adoption of the Create a Clean Water Future campaign. This is an outreach campaign that can be used for MS4 purposes as well as general information to get your stakeholders to understand the impacts of stormwater runoff and how they can reduce it in their everyday lives. There was construction of a Gator Alley boardwalk. This is a demonstration project on a very popular thoroughfare and boardwalk in the city of Daphne. It's got great low impact development included in it, as well as a step pool stormwater conveyance project. And it just has a lot of great informational signage for people to better understand what's going on throughout the watershed. There was development and implementation of a mobile-based subwatershed monitoring framework. You know, we were doing all this restoration work and we wanted to be able to comprehensively understand what were the impacts of that from a number of different areas. And then there was an engineering and resource management capacity building component. We hosted multiple technology transfer workshops where we brought in third parties who deal with these projects more regularly from outside of our community. You know, when we first started, there wasn't a lot of expertise among the different engineering firms for these types of projects. And we were actually able throughout this process to bring all these competing engineering firms together to sit at a table and trade um, not only information, but tips and tricks to do a better job. So egos were set aside, competition was set aside, and we were really able to focus on getting the best projects for Doleve. All right, as we wrap up here, when you're dealing with a watershed restoration project of this size, there's going to be challenges. Accessibility was one of those. You know, we were proposing something new in a heavily populated area, and we were going to landowners 
and seeking permission. You know, that takes a lot of time. You can only proceed so far with the design and permitting without those landowner agreements. And so although it got somewhat easier the more projects we did because we had a track record of success and we had gained the trust of the community, there's still a lot of time invested, um, whether it be walking the site or reviewing the design. Um, accessibility is always going to be an issue. Adaptive management, whether that's invasive species or damage from hurricane or severe weather events, we're going to have to adaptively manage these projects into the future and have already done so uh, more than once on some of these completed projects. And that rolls into the cost of financing. You know, as we sunset some of these oil spill monies, um, you start to think about how are we going to continue to maintain and construct new projects moving forward into the future. And that also is part of keeping up with growth. We know there's more work to be done and the community every day continues to grow in population and have more impervious surfaces. And so last, it's an adoption and implementation continuation of the Doe Leave Watershed update. You know, it's going to be the same things, though it is an update with improved information. It's going to be an intergovernmental task force, improving degraded streams and addressing sedimentation, increasing access, improving degraded habitats and wetlands. And so we're going to keep trudging on with that um, until we get the job done. And so looking forward to continuing that. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to follow up with me at any time. I'd be glad to speak with you. And so safe travels home and thank you for your time today. Thank you. Okay, the last paper is by Greg Blanchard with Manatee County, the Manatee County Coastal Watershed Program. This will be our virtual um, presentation. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, great. All right, then I will go ahead. First of all, thank you very much for staying for the last paper of the talk. I hope I'm going to make it worth your while. I'm going to start with the disclaimer that I'm a water quality specialist, not a restoration specialist. I'm not presenting a restoration technique today, but a process for leveraging the engineering and water quality studies that we use for watershed level water quality improvements. I'm hoping it may be relevant for some of you working at watershed level restoration projects. And may I have the next slide, please? Mandy County's Coastal Watershed Program is a roughly 15-year effort to reduce nutrient loads from stormwater runoff originating in the coastal watersheds of the county. A Deepwater Horizon Restore grant provides for program administration during this period. We seek separate funding from sources like the Water Management District for each program watershed. The program exploits coordinated engineering by our public works department and water quality studies by us, the Parks and Natural Resources Department, of unincorporated watersheds that drain more or less directly to Tampa and Sarasota Bays. These are our receiving water bodies of uh, importance. Water quality studies propose a customized suite of water quality improvements to reduce nutrient loads, which is our environmental goal and respect the need for a resilient stormwater management system, which is our public works department's goal. Structural water quality improvements may be green or gray infrastructure. We don't restrict the type. Non-structural improvements in practices such as outreach and natural systems improvements, which may include constructed enhancements such as stream or channel restoration wetlands or bank techniques. Finally, an observation. I was very struck by a comment made by a speaker on day one of this conference to the effect that one needed to build big networks for watershed restoration. And I was struck by that because we appeared to be on exactly the same trajectory. May I have the next slide, please? For those of you unfamiliar with the local geography, Manatee County is located at the mouth of Tampa Bay on the south side of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. Maybe you went there on a field trip earlier this week. That's the Manatee River that divides the county north-south, and the scale bar shown in the left is five miles. 
The orange shaded air area roughly represents the scope of our current coastal watershed program. These are watersheds that we are planning to work on in the next two or three years, or those that we've done previously. This area includes about half the county, but I'm sorry, I did not measure it. The area includes old urban areas along Sarasota Bay and the Manti River, and newer developments of the Brain River watershed in South Central County. That's the area called Lakewood Ranch, and we call East County colloquially. There are out parcels that our program was not working on. The black hatching shows the city limits of the two largest incorporated cities, Bradenton and Palmetto. Several island communities occupy the barrier islands. Stormwater from FDOT, the transportation facilities, passed through all these areas, and it's probably the single biggest regret I have because they are major stormwater runoff sources. Stormwater runoff is a major source of nutrient loads to receiving waters. Manatee County averages 53 inches of rainfall per year, according to the Manatee Water Atlas. Nutrients most important to us are total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and the indicator parameter chlorophyll A, all of which the state has developed numeric concentration standards. Next slide, please. The genesis of our coastal watershed program was when it was realized that efforts to provide watershed scale environmental and stormwater improvements could be coordinated. Planning for both types of improvements required significant, and for that you can read expensive, prerequisite engineering assessments, particularly in watersheds where very technical flood protection improvements were needed. Coordinating the environmental proper, uh, priorities of the Parks and Natural Resources Department by department with the Public Works Department's stormwater system priorities improved program efficiency. Both studies draw on the same data and engineering assessments, and there are significant savings. The order is much less important to us in Parks Department. Stormwater system enhancements sought by the Public Works Department include a array of general service improvements, which they colloquially refer to as betterment, flood protection improvements, and resiliency features, everything but O&M outreach and administration, which are separately funded. The Coastal Watershed Program capitalizes upon the county's overall strengths. Manti County provides stream gauge and water quality data required for both the engineering and water quality studies. However, both data collection programs have had to grow quite dramatically to meet new information needs. Coastal Watershed Program also benefits from our municipal stormwater permit, the famous NPDES MS4 permit that is uh, EPA issued nationwide. One of the compliance activities is an annual evaluation of the stormwater management program, which we found provides valuable insights. Next slide, please. What uh, the expected benefits of our, our program are, natural systems will directly benefit when where natural systems provide for water quality improvements in the target watershed. Excuse me, I had a computer glitch just a second ago. This is particularly true for stream or channel restorations that seem to be emerging as a water quality improvement of choice, albeit a pricey one. Water quality improvements may benefit water quality in receiving water bodies. These may be particularly observable by our monitoring programs, which are quite extensive. Similar to the previous water quality improvements, I hope may benefit existing natural systems in receiving water bodies. I am still looking for metrics here, maybe fewer algae blooms, more seagrasses. Any suggestions will be appreciated. The overall program provides an opportunity to add increasingly important resiliency features to the stormwater system, 
which is a goal very much desired by our public works department. The overall program provides an opportunity to enhance community amenities or aesthetics. And I remind you, we are part of the parks department and we do like to make our citizens happy. Last slide, please. Currently, we're about halfway through our third uh, watershed water quality assessment. Conceptual in the ground projects are just starting to emerge. Funding to build what we have been advised to build is sought separately outside the assessment project calendar. The reason being is because this stage is very lengthy, iterative, and usually involves a lot of stakeholder input. An important part of any construction project is the feasibility studies that provide the additional engineering work and final designs prior to seeking funding. We found that this is becoming much more commonly a prerequisite for funding sources where significant engineering is required. It's a risk reduction measure, basically. Another activity that we'd like to do is a showcase a stream restoration improvement at the centrally accessible GT Bray Regional Park in West Bradenton. This example should promote similar improvements elsewhere. It's a place where people can come and see an actual model stream restoration of similar scale and configuration to what we might be proposing in their backyards. We're continuing to seek water quality improvements in new and additional watersheds, working up by the Port Manatee area in the next few years. However, we will be visiting, revisiting a few earlier efforts, mainly in the Braid River watershed, to bring the work there up to current standards. Finally, uh, we're trying to identify a role for green infrastructure and local stormwater management policies and procedures. It should be more used more commonly, especially good resiliency technique, but we're having trouble finding a role for it. And that is it. Uh, thank you very much. I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Greg. We this have is the point lots where we're going to have for opportunity to ask any questions. So please, um, if there are mics available, or raise your hand and we'll try and get a mic to you. Kyle, are you back there? Yeah. <laughs> um, can you address uh, BMPs and how that uh, affects permitting and water quality standards during hydroblasting? So off the top of my head, I don't have that information for you when it comes to the water quality of that. So we're not actually putting anything back into the water system. When we're pulling out of the ditches, it's a we're just pulling the water that's flood water and as we're blasting the 360 area that water is just trickling down through the sediment filtering back through the mangroves so i don't believe we actually have any studies that i know of for that no and the only thing i'll add to that kevin is um as usual there are the full floating turbidity barriers at the end of the ditches silt screen is required in certain areas um, but when you're far enough away from the ditch, it works. It doesn't go that far, the sediment, and they do 360 to even it out. And um, so it's not usually needed, but where, the, where it is, they're, they're required. Correct. Yeah. Um, when we're down in our Ruskin at our mitigation point, even though we were a half a mile up from the actual bay, half a mile, three quarters mile, we still did have a turbidity barrier at the beginning, which then was removed right away after we were finished so the seeds can be coming all of that and the flooding on that but like tom just said we don't have all because we're on that 
Um, just to follow up to uh, what we, you were talking about just there with um, the turbidity and whatnot. Um, my question is, where does this spoil go? Because in my mind, I see it getting sprayed out and thus smothering the existing vegetation. So I'm, I'm very curious what you end up doing with that spoil. Okay, so you would think that that would be the case, and it's until really you put your boots on it. But so what we do, we try to, without cutting our self water fly, we spray it back into the ditch. But we also spray a 360. So what's out there is most is pretty much all mangroves. So you're spraying it in between the existing mangrove roots. So as like all the properties coming from the red mangroves, all you're doing is spray it in there, but we're spraying it, say 50 feet wall long. So all of that is being poured. So nothing is actually being smothered. It's actually taking the existing down and we're trying to put it back into the ditch but not fill the ditch just enough so water can float in and create an area for that. I had the same thought you did, but as you see, that sediment was there originally. It's not like that was brought in. So that's just going back to its natural place and then allowing for the seeds that are naturally dispersed to grow and germinate later on. Um, I have two questions. My first one is, um, has anyone done any studies that you know of that kind of track the marine organisms and how the pumping of the water from the environment and kind of spreading it around in that way would impact their like larval stages and distribution, things like that? For the hydroblasting and all that, for the pumping of that water? Yeah, for the marine organisms who are okay. living in that water. So what we're dealing with out there is these old, old, supposed, that's great for the environment, mosquito ditches that say, hey, the little fish will come in, eat the larva. Well, it didn't actually end up ever working. So we're just actually pumping during a high tide or during water level, just the water. Now we actually do have filters to suck up the water. So are like filters on the end to suck up on our pump. So we're not sucking big things, but what do we know for any mosquito or any larval for anything? Nothing really because it's in its own, we're, we're up in the water column, uh, in the column. And these aren't natural nursery areas. Now there are, little fish in them, but we don't see any type of small or macro, any type of organisms throughout there. Um, it's pretty much just flood water that's coming in or high tide water, and it's pretty stagnant too. And you can tell by smelling it. So it just floods in. There is no actual movement on a grand scale. It's more of just coming in there, settling, and as the water washes from all of the mangroves, it washes back. So when it comes to any type of larva or any type of flights or anything through there, we haven't had to do any studies because our grand scale is creating a larger mangrove area. And now the size of these oil mounds can be gigantic. I mean, they can be half the size of the room. So what was there originally was all mangrove forest and all sun spoil mounds. I mean, you'll have different kinds of invasives on there. Once they're cleared out, it becomes its natural habitat again. So as we're looking at what can grow there, it's growing back what should naturally there. It's one of the greatest restoration style, even though it is a simple technique, for what we accomplish in months, you couldn't accomplish that in years of growing mangroves in the nursery by itself and then going out there and planting. The density of mangroves just from natural seed prop propagation is, exorbitant amount on that. Gotcha. Um, and then my other question is, I'm currently doing an undergraduate thesis on a mangrove environment where there is a spoil mound and lots of invasives, um, and we're testing out different invasive removal techniques. Um, and so from my experience, that spoil mound has a lot of sand and shell. And I was wondering if, um, when you spread that around, how that impacts the dynamics of the peat buildup in the mangroves and how that would change the nutrients and things like that, or if a spoil like that would just not be um, a good candidate for that kind of restoration technique. 
So in the mangroves, when you're walking through them back there, you're walking on a lot of different the detritus and all of that and all the leaves, anything decaying. And you're right, as we break down, the sand is naturally covering that up. However, within just a couple high tides, all of that stuff underneath and all that stuff washed away settles back down. And then you have all your organics and inorganics. It looks like sterile sand but it builds up so quickly because there's so many nutrients all throughout there that it builds up quickly. So you can do a baseline study of, hey, we blew this down, let's see how this sediment and what's in there looks, and then literally come back in a few weeks and say, wow, look how much it's grown up. So, but yeah, you can look also into how the depth too on what's surrounding and how different bases will not grow on that too. And, and it's only a matter of inches. I mean, we could be six, eight inches in height different and still be not low enough for Brazilian peppers. So when we're out there, we're actually creating and looking and mapping and then doing elevation surveys to make sure everything is low enough to make sure no invasives grow. Because I mean, especially for Brazilian peppers, if we're off by a few inches, they'll grow back up and then it ruins the whole reason of restoration. So my question is from Megan. Um, so in regards to your mangrove stress sites, um, how long do you anticipate the stress sites will take to regain their um, above ground bio match to kind of match those natural sites that you guys are following, um, you know, monitoring, following your culvert installation? And also how long are you guys anticipating doing post monitoring on those sites? Um, so a lot of how long we anticipate actually doing the post monitoring will depend on funding. But I know from like some of our previous projects, um, we've seen a recovery start within a few years. But for it to get back to its fully um, natural state, I'm not entirely sure how long it would take. Um, so it'll be interesting to look at and see how much we can see when we go back. Hello, um, I have a question about the hydroblasting as well. Um, so I did an undergraduate thesis on mangrove restoration and monitoring for a long term. And what we found in some of our sites, it took like up to like 20 years for the vegetation to get back to like the normal forest levels. And I know there's like literature showing like the soil can take up to like 50 years. So I was wondering if after your hydroblasting, you've had the chance to go back and like monitor those sites again to see what they're looking like a couple years after it doesn't take six months and like especially during a, a mangrove growing season there's so much high tidal influence especially with how these mosquito dishes were created and so much seedlings seed pods come through there within six months we can go back to areas and i can't even see the ground all of the mangroves now, of course, they're going to outcompete each other and the strongest will survive. But right away, like I said, we went out there and the white mangroves looked like a clover field. All you saw them spreading out. And then as we've gone back years and years later, you'll see which stronger ones. But it still was complete coverage. I mean, density, even though it started at 100% density six, eight months later, the strongest survived. Density went down, but then they started growing bigger and bigger. So that's it. So we're not actually having to see years down the road. This is nature doing its thing. This is weeks down the road as soon as, because as soon as it, we are right at that level when we blast them down, but as soon as a high, high tide comes in and sets those seeds down, they just take off because water goes down and they sit there and it takes whatever weeks. So they germinate right away. So it's, it's not, it's, it's immediate results in the way of restoration we see not long term we see weeks of how it can be you know you'll see you'll see whites reds and blacks just automatically pop up through there along with that you have all of the outside plants that surround it growing in as well you know you'll see all your runners shooting off and there's so many black mangrove metaphors sticking up that they start growing into it as well so you have outside and from the inside too from seed pods and I'll add to that just so we had to look at some of these projects years after. And um, the oldest ones we saw when you walked into, we had to figure out where you were because it's so thick with mangroves at this point, but they were just a few feet shorter than what was around them. So um, 
it takes a few years to get the tall to the height, but um, those post assessments show that it was very difficult to even find them because it was pretty much the same height. All right. Yeah, another question for, for Kyle. Poor guy. <laughs> um, so let's uh, so let's say a, a state, federal, or local government has decided that they've made the decision to fill in these mosquito ditches for whatever reason. I sense that there might be concern with this this process. Can you elaborate on the alternative to uh, filling in a mosquito ditch and what the cost of that method might be? Well, let me start with that. I'll, I'll, I, um, for him. Yeah, I'll start out with that. The state was really concerned about 15 years ago about doing this at all, right? Because there are concerns. We're putting a lot of sediment, even if it's done perfectly, 360, you're putting sediments in the in the mangroves, and is that a problem? So they came out to the first ones ever done to assess this. Prior to that, you're using heavy equipment. McDill, McDill Air Force Base went out with heavy equipment and removed spoil mounds. It took seven years okay, for it to return. So this is an alternative that was get it back quicker. Now, the objective a long time ago was let's fill all these ditches because historically they weren't there, they shouldn't be there. But a USGS study showed that these are very beneficial for juvenile fish, especially closer to this wherever source water they're at. And so we are not in the business of filling ditches. We are in the business of removing these spoil mounds and in the, if the spoil, if these ditches went into the saltern community that used to be there, right at that intersection, that's where we put a ditch block. So water still can go around the ditch block, over the ditch block on high tide, but it can't just leave at every tide so we can get that saltern community back. So it's not wholesale filling ditches as it is just getting rid of these upland spoil mounds and getting your mangroves back so you have sheet flow through the mangroves. So I don't know if that answered it, and I don't want to take any away. Anything that Kyle wants to answer, but the point being that if you wanted to eliminate the spoil mounds, the other option would be to bring in heavy that that's, There's no other way, which would completely wipe out massive amounts of mangroves. And and the footprint. I mean, so we're walking in there, and it is very labor intensive. But you, the other flip side, you bring in bulldozers, you have to turn those. You could say, okay, we can just go straight. It's only no, you have to turn around, and you have to bring. And then you're bringing, yes, we do have gas cans we bring in, but it's not, you're bringing in diesel trucks, you're bringing in whatever else. You have things with machinery that break out there. You have hydraulic spills, oil spills, and all that. Here, it's exactly what you have. You have manpower using a water source, blowing it 360, or beneficial. Even though it's more labor intensive, we're seeing results right away. If you were just to remove the mounds and keep the ditches, you then have to go back. You can push these mounds away but then you have to go back and keep grading grading proper so you have that proper overflow for the seeds because if not you have it like this and the water doesn't go over your seeds are only going to stop right here and that's the big thing you want the mangroves to grow back i mean it's like when you're going out in the forest and a, a trail or a truck just drives up and down the trail you know that's it would be the same impact here it's just people walking and blowing away so is it more labor intensive? Yes, but however, it's more beneficial on a scale of when you're done, it's immediately starts restoring on itself. And that's what we're looking for. Hi, I have a question for Kyle. No, I'm kidding, for Brandon. Uh, <laughs> hey, let's, we're all going outside right now. Just, <laughs> we're all doing this. Today. So Brandon, with regards to the peer, um, you talked about shareholder engagement and Kind of something that that I've always said when we undergo these projects is that unless you've got all the space in the world, a project can't be all things to all people. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of talk about how you manage shareholder uh, desires and expectations through such a high profile project like what you saw with the pier? There are a lot of levels to shareholder engagement when it came to the peer. Uh, luckily, many of them I didn't have to deal with. But if you remember, the first kind of cut at shareholder engagement was the peer that's there wasn't the peer that was gonna be there. There was a, a 
a contractor selected, or not a contractor, but a design team and a previous design called the Lens that was signed off on and ready to go. And then an entire city referendum pulled that design back and they basically started from scratch. So we went from, there was that level of engagement and then there was an extensive design process to get to the team that actually to ASD and Sky were the architects. Um, they led the, the actual design, you know, we supported them. But there was an entire uh, design process and competition uh, that the city selected. And then, and through that, um, they held a lot of uh, stakeholder and public engagement to get ideas and thoughts. And fishing was a, a good example. The city wanted that, but a lot of citizens wanted that. Um, so you kind of graduate to the next level is, okay, we know we want fishing. Well, does that mean we want it the whole length of the pier or just a designated area? And that rolled right into the stakeholders from the regulatory agencies. Um, the uh, Audubon Society and Fish and Wildlife, uh, US Fish and Wildlife, were at first talking about some carcass tubes, which is basically a big straw that you can put a carcass in and it goes to the bottom. Well, that gets it away from the birds. And that's the people that were concerned with the birds like that idea. But then the sawfish and sea turtles and everything else go down to the bottom of that straw and look for the buffet. And that congregates, it could has, have the potential to congregate uh, protected species. So there was absolutely a lot of, I don't wanna say push and pull, but there were conversations and compromises all along the way to get to the criteria that that we came to, um, that that the design tried to accommodate, I would I would say, but certainly engagement was key along that process from design ideas. They certainly didn't want to put something out there that it was going to be another another referendum that the citizens would take away to getting to the fine details of okay, we're talking about wildlife concerns which wildlife, how, how do we balance this uh, from fish, birds, um, dogs on the beach, uh, you know, leaving the rack line versus grading it. Well, it's a recreational beach, it's fill. You know, what are the priorities? There's a lot of options and we just try to explore as many as we could. Brandon, I'm particularly happy that you talked about fishing. For those of you who didn't know the late Jan Platt, that was something that was really, really important to her. And she raised that issue at any forum where she could, because fishing is part of our culture and our way of life here. And those shore-based free fishing opportunities are disappearing. And so that was a really important conversation and a piece to include. And it's something that we should all keep at the forefront of our minds as we're continuing to develop our coastline. Because if people aren't fishing, that's one less opportunity for them to fall in love with the bay. So I just really appreciate you bringing up that point. Yeah, it was, from the city's standpoint, from what I recall, I'm certainly not speaking for the city, but that connection to that uh, community asset was non-negotiable for them, uh, you know, in some regard. They, they wanted to make sure that was included in any of the designs. And I'm just thinking about in the context of the conversations <laughs> we're having about equity as well, those opportunities are really important for people who fish to feed their families. And so if we're trying to like think about ways that we can broaden, you know, who we engage with and who our work is relevant to, that's another important link is those subsistence fishers. And, and that was part of that conversation that this is a public amenity and that restricting that access, that, that exact point was brought up as part of that discussion, absolutely. Another question about the uh, hydroblasting. <laughs> <laughs> but actually before that, just to make my happy, um, I was going to ask a question for Nicole. Uh, and Nicole, I, I mentioned to this, this to you at the poster session the other night. Um, you know, I think one of the big challenges at the moment are not so much riparian corridors. You know, in some ways they're the low-hanging fruit, but in the north-south corridors, um, and I've expanded to you know, uh, members of the Tampa Bay program, but you know, can you comment on what we can do to get 
those corridors going between the riparian corridors um, to allow for that um, north-south shift of species. Sure. Yeah. So thank you. I actually didn't think that question was free. <laughs> um, so yeah, essentially, you know, speaking to the habitat restoration needs plan that we kind of um, talk about through that um, economic lens is what we are looking to do as as a regional entity, as a CHNEP, we actually span two water management districts, which is another kind of um, dividing line, sort of a, a political dividing line, um, as well as like how the counties are and the cities are. And so um, one of the things that was identified in the Habitat Restoration Needs Plan was, um, again, creating those corridors, identifying those corridors like the Mayaka River Corridor, which does, uh, that one's a little bit more east-west, obviously, but there are some north-south aspects when you're talking about, for instance, the Peace River and uh, stretching up to Polk County and making those investments all along that corridor. And there are a lot of opportunities still along the Peace River. And we're kind of at this unique place in, at least in the CHNEP area, where not all of that is developed. A lot of it's still an ag or um, you know, and so there there are some great opportunities that have been identified through that that project uh, in particular uh, to preserve that sort of north south movement. And actually, I encourage you all to visit uh, the CHNP Water Atlas where we have an interactive mapper where you can kind of click through that. And we have a couple of appendices that specifically address um, restoration towards more headwater areas and then also um, abandoned mining areas as potential areas that could be. Uh, brought into that that full corridor and um, creating those sort that sort of north south movement of wildlife. Um, this this plan in particular was focused obviously on wildlife and habitat protection, but I mean there's so many other opportunities in those areas besides that you know hydrologic function and and a few other things as well. Hope I answered that. I get excited talking about those projects. So. Perfectly. Okay. Back, um, the hydroblast in question. Um, okay. you, you touched on the you only need a few millimeter, you know, a few inches to you know put it you know within the range of um, the Brazilian pepper. Um, sort of that same idea. Looking at salt barrens as opposed to mangroves. Um, how easy is it to create salt barrens with um, hydroblast in? given that they're an, an evaporative surface and you need a essentially a slightly concave type um, you know, shape there, how easy is it to, I guess, ensure that kind of uh, shape when you're spraying water well, somewhat indeterminately? First thing to understand that these spoil mounds and these ditches that were created were usually on the forefront of all natural mangroves and then we don't usually get to the salt turns and the salt areas until the end of the actual ditch everything flowing through there is actual mangrove mostly met red and black mangroves then you get into your whites when you get into your salt so you may have two three hundred yards of red mangroves that we're blasting around now how easy it for that as you're cutting trails or walking out to these spoil mounds and i wish i had the picture to show but you can saw all those little white dots as you're walking you'll start going through your upland your pine trees and then all of a sudden you'll get to your spark pine grasses and all of that and that's where you know your salt turns at then you get into the mangroves so we sit there and we go okay this is where we need to create a dish block so we can have that evaporate but when it goes that we're not we're usually not blowing in those areas for the fact that we know this is going to be a salt turn area. So we're actually blowing it the opposite way. And that's one thing where we're, we're, we're not just going out there and saying, okay, let's just start blasting. There's a plan in place. Hey, we need to do dish blocks here because this is the restoration that's gonna go on for this area. And so we can break it up into different zones and say, okay, this is gonna be all of our reds. This is gonna be our black area or white area. All right, we know that if water only is gonna come up so high most of the year, only on extreme high, that's when this will see. So we're gonna go ahead on a higher area and plant them ourselves. But if you think lower, the ocean's gonna take care of that mm -hmm. over there. So we actually break it down by zones. And so we know not to blow into that. In fact, we're using the existing terms or recreating them. Okay, it's 
lot of these ditches have blocked them off to where they're not there. So we're actually creating flats again. My question is for Nicole, and I'm sorry if you already mentioned this, I was trying to make sure the cookies got here on time, but <laughs> um, so much of what you talked about is so important. I'm wondering if part of the tools that you mentioned is a, a communication tool. How do we get a lot of this important information about natural resources being economic drivers to the people who are in charge? So how are we gonna get this information to policymakers and all the other stakeholders? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you're touching upon a really key issue there too, is um, oftentimes we create these products and then the next step is actually getting them out into the hands of the people that are actually gonna use them. And so that was sort of the, the thought process behind creating these really easily digestible fact sheets because um, policymakers aren't gonna go out and read our economic valuation study report. They don't have that kind of time. So um, creating those fact sheets um, that are very, very laser focused on their area of interest and then basically going on a campaign to continue to bring these out to these policymakers. Um, you know, we, we bring them at the policy committee meetings, but also trying to actually mail them to them and go to their offices and, and you know, um, our executive director has presented in front of county commissions and she brings all of these fact sheets that are again very laser focused on the areas of interest in their area. And we actually tried to pick projects that different entities had already implemented or were implementing currently in their region and, and show them the justification for continued investments in projects like that, especially when we're talking about capital improvements projects and stormwater and wastewater investments, which are gonna um, pay dividends when it comes to water quality um, and hydrology down the road. And so um, that's, that's, part and kind of, that's part and parcel with, with that exactly. And we're always open to new ideas with continuing to share these, also getting these into the hands of citizens. Um, um, in those counties and in those areas to help them understand what the benefits are of supporting those types of initiatives. So, so Dave Tomasco is online and has a question for you, Nicole. So Dave, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Hey, Nicole, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. So um, I've always liked the work that you guys did and uh, we have a uh, quite a bit of overlap in, in some of the issues like red tide, for example. And so we are comfortable, and I believe you guys are as well, with making the connection that humans don't cause red tide, but we can cause it to be worse. Um, you know, I know you guys have like done a lot of work with Larry Brand. We've got the one paper by Miles Medina, the second one that's gonna come out. Uh, we're pushing for, you know, um, that to be a part of people's like mindset about why you want nutrient load reductions. And we've actually gone a little bit farther than that. And we've actually brought in some real estate work that's been done by researchers at University of Rhode Island, showing a depression in the home values of 20 to 30% up to a mile inland in areas affected by red tide versus controlled counties. And we just thought that was a kind of a cool thing. And I'm wondering, we just want to make sure we're not inconsistent with you guys and your communicating about like uh, ecosystem services, you know, there's a, a TMDL that calls for about a 40% load reduction in the Caloosahatchee River for the health of Caloosahatchee. We also think there's a benefit in terms of red tide as, uh, along with that. So just want to put that out there just so that we're all on the same kind of like wavelength. We don't necessarily have to agree on everything, but we don't want to have someone say, no, nah, I think that's bullshit. So, you know, that's what I put out there. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Um, tying basically, this is quantifying ecosystem services, taking it to that next level. But the Balmoral Group actually did create um, a product that helps not just how home values are affected by being close to a water body, but how there is a difference between being close to a clean water body versus one that's not perceived as as necessarily like clean and clear water. So. That was something that they factored into um, part of our overall economic valuation study. And I think there's also um, a tool, an online tool that they've created looking at red tide. And I know we had a presentation on this earlier in the week too, but looking at red tide in our area and quantifying economic um, hits that we took even just by the perception of, of red tide in the um, Coastal and Heartland Partnership area in Southwest Florida. And um, so that was a tool created by, again, I think Balmoral Group and, and a few others. Um, I think it's available, a link from our website, but the Charlotte Harbor was one of the focus areas because we didn't get as much um, of the last red tide, but the one before that was really um, rough for the area. So um, that actually quantified just how the perception of red tide really impacted the economy in the area and water quality as well. So 
Thank you all. All right. Thanks, Nicole. Um, cool panel for speaking today and taking questions. I really appreciate that. Um,